Public transit is pretty bad in North America. It's inefficient, it's slow, it doesn't take you anywhere you want to go, and in most cities, with very few exceptions, nobody takes it unless they're really desperate. What's worse is that even when US and Canadian cities do build new transit projects, they often have very low ridership. But if you look at many other cities in the world, public transit actually works pretty well. It's clean and efficient, and many people happily use it for all kinds of trips, providing low-cost transportation options, reducing car travel, and generally making the city better for everyone. So what's the difference? We can't build rapid transit here. Our population is too small. If you've ever lived in a small to mid-sized US or Canadian city, you've probably heard this before. I've certainly heard it said in my car-infested hometown of London, Ontario, Canada, a city with no rapid transit at all. Just some infrequent bus service that's constantly stuck in traffic. A few years ago, there was a discussion in my hometown about building an LRT. That's the North American code word for tram because streetcars have a bad name mostly because they're built wrong and always get stuck in traffic. But anyway, it was decided that ridership numbers couldn't justify building an LRT, so the plan was downgraded to a BRT, or Bus Rapid Transit. And then it was downgraded to maybe regular buses, or maybe not happening at all, but I made a separate video about that. In that video, I mentioned that the city of Innsbruck in Austria, with a population of less than 150,000 people, has six tram lines in addition to frequent bus service, and over 300 intercity trains per day. My hometown has a population of over 420,000 people, but apparently it's too small to build a tram. Lots of small towns in Germany have tram lines too. In fact, there are 40 cities in Germany with a population of less than my hometown that have tram lines. Oh, sorry, wait a second. Bielefeld doesn't exist, so it's only 39, but that's still a lot. And what's even more ridiculous is that my hometown did have a tram, sorry, streetcar, in the late 1800s, but it was torn out in the 1940s. So somehow, when the population was less than one-tenth of what it is today, it could support a tram, but now it can't. Why? The answer to this question is the true reason why public transit sucks so much in North America. It's because we don't build our cities for transit anymore. Today, cities in the US, Canada, and other places like them are built for cars. It didn't used to be that way. They all had tram, I mean streetcar lines. Seriously, look it up. Los Angeles had the most extensive electric streetcar network in the world. And even places like Regina, Saskatchewan and Chattanooga, Tennessee had streetcars. But nowadays, we don't build for transit. Instead, we build for cars. And when traffic becomes a gaping wound that is bleeding us dry, we try to apply the transit band-aid because we've heard that transit can reduce car usage. This is exactly the situation that London found itself in when it couldn't afford to widen this road to six lanes. But public transit doesn't work that way. In order for transit to be successful, it needs to have people to ride it and destinations those people want to go to. I know, really mind-blowing revolutions here. This means that people need a transit stop near to where they live and near to the places they want to go. The area around a transit stop that can be accessed by walking is called the walk shed. I guess then the area accessible by biking should be called the bike shed, but that just sounds wrong. So this area around a rapid transit stop is some of the most valuable and critical land in the whole city and this is the key to a successful transit system unfortunately we don't treat this land as if it were important in the us and canada we often subject the area around transit stations to the same strict regulations that prioritize cars for example minimum parking requirements that require a certain amount of parking spaces to be built alongside any new development this doesn't just guarantee that it will be easy to drive here, it also steals valuable land within walking distance of a transit stop that could be used for somebody's home or somebody's destination. This is what the land use looks like around a typical train station connected to Canada's largest city. An empty lot and a self-storage facility. They're more concerned with building parking lots for suburbanites than productive urban places. And I've talked about this before in a previous video. 
A transit plan without a good land use plan is a waste of time and resources because the transit is doomed to fail. It will forever be underfunded and struggling to gain ridership. And a good land use plan without a transit plan is a lost opportunity. And it's likely to just become a funny curiosity or retirement community like most new urbanist developments. These two things need to come together. They are completely dependent on one another. You simply can't have a successful transit plan without a good land use plan. But we don't do this in North America, and this is why our transit projects are doomed to fail. I recently made a video about this crappy business park that I used to work at in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. I compared that transit experience of buses that are always stuck in traffic to a business park development in the Netherlands, built around a train station and a BRT line. Some people said this wasn't fair to Mississauga because, several kilometers away, they have some fancy new BRT stations. And yeah, these BRT stations in Mississauga certainly are impressive, and they've clearly spent a huge amount of money on them, over half a billion dollars in fact. But look at what surrounds them. Here is the view from the train station at the business park in the Netherlands. The buildings are right there, easily accessible by wide sidewalks. And here is the view from the local BRT stop just around the corner. These destinations are immediately accessible to people on foot. Now compare that to Mississauga where they drop you off at the side of a high speed strode and a half a kilometer walk to the nearest building through a sea of car parking. This place is not designed for transit. It's a place designed for driving with transit as an overlay to car centric planning. For example, at this station, there are these houses only 150 meters away, but there's no connection except via the roads. So you'd need to walk almost a kilometer along a strode like this to get there. And you could theoretically get to the area around my old office, but you'd need to walk over a kilometer in the other direction along a narrow sidewalk like this. Now, Mississauga may build a bunch of high-rises near these transit stops, as some other suburbs of Toronto have done. But this BRT station has been here since 2014, and the area around it still looks like this. But regardless of those hypothetical developments, I guarantee you they won't be reducing the size of this strode, which means there's always going to be a huge amount of car traffic around these stations, which will require parking lots, parking garages, and driveways that make this place less inviting to people outside of a car. This public transit, as fancy and expensive as it is, will never be as successful as the same transit connected to a mixed-use walkable neighborhood. Now, this isn't exactly an unknown concept to American planners, which is why in recent years there's been a lot of talk about TOD, or Transit-Oriented Development. The idea is that the area around rapid transit stops is upzoned, that is, allowed to be something other than a single-family home or a parking lot. In this way, new developments are created in places where public transit is convenient for the people who live, work, and shop there. City Beautiful recently made an excellent video about transit-oriented development that's definitely worth watching if you'd like to see some examples of this done right in the US. Now the problem is that TOD is often far too limited. Here in Toronto, for example, where there's a subway station and a new LRT station being built, the avenues directly next to the transit station, shown here in red, may be upzoned, but the rest of the area, in yellow, is still all single-family detached homes. This creates such intense pressure to build on the small amount of upzoned land that developers cram in as many units as possible. So you get huge condo towers right next to single-family homes within a five-minute walk of a transit station. A better solution is to allow and encourage walkable mixed-use developments within a 10 to 15-minute walk shed of every rapid transit station. In most cases, this would allow for a more gradual range of missing middle housing like those found in most of Europe, instead of giant condo towers next to single-family homes. Again, Good land use and rapid transit need to go hand in hand, and neither should be built without the other. But here's the problem. If you propose building transit in North America where there is no development, you'll be laughed out of the room. But historically, almost every town in the US and Canada was built this way, 
towns were built next to rapid transit, first canals, and then along railway lines. And as cities grew, they expanded outwards along tram, sorry, streetcar lines. Now, that type of development is considered crazy. But for some reason, we don't think twice about building roads and even highways before development is started. This is seen as completely normal. That's exactly how we get exurbs like this one. Suburban neighborhoods that are connected to nothing. These places will never be accessible by public transit and the people who live here will need to depend on their cars forever. When we design a neighborhood only for cars, people will drive. They will drive to work, they will drive to shop, they will drive to do everything. They will set up their life around driving because there's no other alternative. But once you've built this way, it's almost impossible to put that genie back in the bottle and over time, car traffic will increase indefinitely with no way to build any feasible alternatives. A few years ago, images of this subway station in Chongqing in China were circling around the internet. People in North America were laughing at the stupid Chinese government who built a subway to nowhere. But a few years later, it looked like this, because this wasn't stupid, it was intentional. The city needed more development, so they built it around public transit lines. Now, does this mean we should be building trains to every cornfield and cow pasture in the country? Build more trains! Damn it, Alan, your memes are leaking again. Anyway, no, it doesn't, but it does mean we should be making it legal to build more mixed-use walkable neighborhoods and the transit to go with it. This is the island of Eiberg in Amsterdam. The city needed more housing, so this area was identified as a good candidate close to the city center. But notice that as this area was built, they built the tram line here at the same time. The tram line opened in 2005, just as the first homes were being completed, so as residents moved in, they had regular and reliable transit access to the rest of the city. This ensures that, right from the beginning, these people can build their lives around transit. This place would be totally different if they had built it only for cars and then tried to add transit a few decades later. This is a whole other level of transit-oriented development that is far beyond what you'll find in North America. Now, if you live in the US and Canada, this kind of development is probably beyond your city's ability, but it is possible to build upon those few walkable places that do exist. In his book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, Chuck Marone talks about how transit can be a wealth multiplier for cities, a way to bring value to developments by making them more accessible. But that only works if, when you exit that transit, it brings you somewhere that's friendly to people walking. Not like this. We still have a few old walkable neighborhoods in the US and Canada built before the 1940s. These places have been neglected for too long, but they could be revitalized and good public transit is the wealth multiplier that could make that happen. These walkable places can and should be connected by regular transit that comes so often you don't even need to look at a schedule. A bus coming every, say, 10 minutes or so that loops around this area and connects the historical walkable areas around it would bring with it a massive positive change and would provide the seed that could grow into an expanded rapid transit network in other parts of the city. Chuck's book has more information about how this could be done, so check it out if you're interested. There's a link in the description. In North America, we've forgotten the rules of good land use and we've forgotten how to build good transit that supports it. But if we could dust off those old history books or learn from the places still doing it correctly, we might just be able to start building good transit again. Transit that doesn't suck. Now, I love walkable neighborhoods, and I firmly believe that they are better places to live and better for society as well, and they support the high-quality public transportation systems that you'd actually want to use. One U.S. city that is doing this correctly, okay, well, mostly correctly, is Portland, Oregon. City Beautiful has made a great video about Portland's light rail system that I strongly recommend, and it's available on Nebula. Nebula is the streamy award-winning streaming service that's the perfect place to watch content from independent educational creators like me, as well as City Beautiful and over 140 others. 
You can watch all of my content from YouTube completely ad-free, but also bonus videos, Nebula originals, and other content that's not available anywhere else. By signing up at the link right here, you'll be supporting this channel, as well as all the other independent creators you watch on Nebula in the future. I'd also like to thank my supporters on Patreon who pay me to call out Mississauga. Again. Come on guys, let's get some good land use around those stations, eh? If you'd like your name in this list of supporters, visit patreon.com slash notjustbikes.